put up a poll question that I want to use for just attendance. So just enter the password. Does everybody see it on their phone? The password is clown. C-L-O-W-N. We're not going to discuss that. Just end it. Isn't it great? We have no quiz this week. How are people doing on chapter 7? How many people have finished chapter 7? Raise your hands high. You guys are superheroes. Yeah. How many people have not started chapter 7? Oh, you guys are in trouble. Okay, you guys need to start chapter 7. All right, the password is clown. Everybody got it? Be sure you got it in. I'm going to turn it off. Raise your hand if you need more time to type clown. Wow, how much time does that take? Uh, yeah. I don't care. Be creative. All right. Cut it off. this, you can look at the error like this, 
<coughs> That's the error from the model. Okay. Um, this is a jitter plot. I thought I would use a different plot. And I want to just briefly talk about, again, what does it mean to explain the variation? This is looking at points as the outcome variable and wins, whether you lost the game or won the game, as the explanatory variable on the x-axis. So what would, how many people think wins explains some of the variation in points? You better raise your hand on the call. Aha, it's a tough one, isn't it? OK, who can explain why wins, what it means to say that wins explains some of the variation in points? What does it mean? You can pitch, please. I can tell. Um, if you have, if you, if you most likely have a higher amount of points, it's likely to say that you can win. So the top 130 points is a winner, and then versus the top, which is 120 for losing. So more okay, points. what's our definition of explain variation? Gives you a better idea of guessing. Yeah, what does? If you know what? The In this case, if you know whether they won or lost the game, mm -hmm. good job. It gives you, thank you for participating. I know I've forced you to. It gives you a slightly better guess that you can make. It could happen to any of you, trust me. Um, you can make a better guess about how many points were scored by the Miami Heat in the game just by knowing whether they won or lost. Okay. All right, here, another gesture. Where is the variation in points? Gesture. Everybody in the room better gesture. Okay, that's the variation in points. And where is the variation in win and loss? Won and loss. Okay. All right. And here's the key question. Where would you draw the empty model on this jitter plot? Do it. On um, pull everywhere. Where would you draw the empty model on the jitter plot? Right Who has an answer? Come on, come on. <coughs> oh, sorry. All right, let's see if you guys got. All right. One horizontal at the mean is the most common response. Two horizontal lines at the means of wins and losses is the next most common. Who thought it was two horizontal lines at the means of wins and losses? Could somebody explain it to us what you thought? Yeah? Somebody. One out of every four is the answer. What were you thinking? Tripped up this week. But if we say 
according to the empty model. Where would you draw the empty model? The empty model doesn't have an explanatory variable. It only has the outcome variable. And the empty model is going to be the mean of the outcome variable. The outcome variable is points. So does someone have a question about this who doesn't understand it? Because this is a great place to talk about it. Does anyone have an idea? Yes? Did you get it wrong, by the way? No. Oh. Oh. Um, why don't you repeat what I said? And then I'll tell okay. you what you said what I said. I think what you said was that when we're drawing the empty model, we are trying to do it for a variable that does not have explanatory variables. So yeah, what is the empty model? The empty model is the prediction for what the it's like the best guess, it's the mean. Okay, and how many outcome variables are we, do we have in the empty model? One. One, and how many explanatory variables do we have in the empty model? None. None, so the empty model has one outcome variable and zero explanatory variables. So in this case, what's the outcome variable? Oh, the points. Points, so the, the empty model has to be the mean of points. It can't be anything else, okay? And you're correct. It's it's the mean because the mean is our best prediction of what the next point is going to be. Is it going to be a really good prediction of what the next game's point is going to be? No, it's going to be terrible, but it's going to be better than nothing. That's the whole idea behind statistics, it's better than nothing. Okay. And where in here is the y sub i? I don't think this is a question, just answer. Yes? Each individual dot is a y sub i. And what are those dots? What's each row? Well, what is it in this case? This is points in the Miami Heat data set. Each dot is a game, okay? And it's a y sub i. So y doesn't have to be a person, it can be a game or whatever else. Where is the B sub zero in this picture? It's the line at the mean. And what's this the mean of? The mean of all the points. And where is E sub i in this picture? Who can gesture E sub i? Gesture where E sub i is in this picture. Yeah, it's, and how many E sub i's are there? <coughs> as many as there are games in the data set. Anybody remember how many games? 82. So there's 82 different E sub i's. So when we use the sub i, it means there's going to be one for each unit in the data set. Yes? They definitely have an E sub i, but if they're right on the line, what would the E sub i be? Zero. Because E sub i is the residual. And you calculate the residual by taking that individual score and subtracting the mean. So if those two are the same, you're gonna get zero, okay? All right, um, so last class, I think where we ended is I asked you to calculate the sums of squares and I asked you to see if you could think of a few ways to do it. These are a few ways I thought of, but the sum of squares around the empty model for points in the Miami Heat is 10,485. And here's another question for you. All right, so now you've heard a little bit about sums of squares last time, and you've read about sums of squares. What if you've calculated this? And the sum of squares, by the way, just to remind you, think about this in your head, is you take each data point, you subtract it from the mean, you square it, then you sum all those up. That's the sums of squares, okay? The sum of squared deviations. So what if you calculated sum of squares from the mode instead of the mean? Where is the mode in this distribution? Yeah, around 95. See that big, tall bar there? That's the mode. And that means the most number of games score 95 points, even though the mean is 102. So what if you calculate sum of squares from the mode instead of the mean? Think 
carefully about <laughs> some of the squares and how it's coming. <coughs> a larger number than sum of squares than mean. Okay, who can explain why they think it's a larger number? Yes? Because when you're uh, taking the sum of squares relative to the mean, it's going to be the lowest number you could possibly get from that uh, data. Anytime you take the sum of squares uh, relative to a number which is not the mean, it's going to be larger, and so you're not optimizing your, uh, your data. Okay. Does somebody who chose C, a smaller number than sum of squares? Who chose a smaller number than sum of squares? Come on, sum of them. Who can ex explain whether they think this explanation is correct or not, and why? That's correct. Do you think that's correct? Well, in the, in the first part. I what did you answer, by the way, sir? I put larger. You put what? Larger. Larger, okay. But now I was thinking more smaller. Oh, okay. Why? Uh, just because if we're looking at the sum of squares, it's like how many numbers are like away from it. And since. Uh, the mode has the highest number of you know, data in there, then I think there'll be less residuals, I guess. Okay. All right. All right. That's two good answers. The correct answer here is larger number than the sum of squares. And, and actually, um, and the reason for that is because the sum of squares is minimized at the mean. That's one of the things that's really most useful about the mean is it's the, the only number in the distribution that that can't have um, there cannot be a lower a number that has a lower sum of squares than the mean. So that's really really important. It's minimized. So when we're fitting our empty model to the outcome variable, that sum of squares tells us how much variation there is to explain. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how many explanatory variables we have, that's how much variation we need to explain. And remember we talked last time that if we start explaining some of that variation, we're going to be able to divide that variation up into the explained variation and the error, the model and the error. And that's going to add up to 100%. Okay. So that's just repeating what I just said. Sum of squares minimize at the mean. Very important point. And no other number is going to produce a lower sum of squares than the mean. And so the mean, this is just another thing that's interesting about the mean. We already learned that it balances perfectly, that the residuals add up to zero, but it's also true that, it's the, that it minimizes some square. I just had a question about why that's the case. Is it just because the residuals in total like sum to the smallest value like that they can? So when you square all of them, it reaches the smallest squared amount, that sense. Wow, I don't even know if I can explain exactly why that is. Gee, can you explain that? Why are the sum of squares minimized at the mean? Give it a try. Yeah. Encore performance. Um, like, 
that's a good way to answer that. Maybe we can figure it out. Yeah. Hmm? It doesn't even have to be normal for this to be true. Yeah. Like, that's what's cool about this. Because partly it has to do with the fact that this is the, the point that's going to perfectly balance the residuals, <laughs> right? And so, you know... So if you square think, the residuals... Yeah. Here's a kind of visual mental analogy I want you to have. Like imagine there are these points over here and there are these points over here and they, they're both like pulling on a rubber band, right? The mean is gonna be the point that where the rubber band is being pulled kind of evenly by both sides and anywhere you move the mean, if, not the mean, but anywhere you move that point, it's, it's gonna you know kind of tip on one side or another. And so it's kind of, um, I feel like I need to draw some triangles or something. Let me Here. try. Draw them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. All right. We're watching her. <laughs> She's drawing a line. Here, maybe She's it would be easier with points. just two points, right? You know? And, you know, you could imagine like a tug of war between the two points. They're like trying to tug each other, right? And then, so the. You could imagine drawing kind of squares right at the two points, right? And then try moving this line over a little bit, like here, right? So now it's this square versus kind of kind of bigger square. And the point is those squares have to add up to more than the total. For yeah, two and those two squares are, yeah. I, I don't know if this is a good, <laughs> this is not really an explanation <laughs> of why, but it's, I guess, more of an illustration of the point. It's almost like a ge geometric thing. I feel like if we sit down and do some more Pythagorean theorem stuff, we might be able to prove it. And we can prove it yeah. while we're doing the lecture. I feel like we could maybe prove it. Yeah. All right. Because you know? this is like... This is what, this is like A, and this is B, right? And so the whole square is like B squared, and this is A squared, and somehow like these and two you add them up, it's C squared. Yeah, it is C squared, yeah. <laughs> All right, add anyway, and figure I'm not out. sure the algebra is yeah. It's so fun to figure out these things. All right. So let's move on. This is um, the points broken up in a facet grid. On the top, we have the distribution of points for losses, and on the bottom, distribution of points <coughs> for wins. So this is just another view of what I showed you in the jitter plot. Um, and I want you to look at the variability. Gesture the variability of losses. Where's the variability of losses? I don't see everybody gesturing. I see someone texting, but not gesturing. Yeah, there you go, good. Um, and what about the variability of wins? And which do you think has more variability? Why do you think the wins has more variability? How much bigger is the range really? It goes sort of from 90 to 130 versus 75 to 115, maybe a little bit bigger, okay? Maybe a little bit bigger. So um, I went and I calculated the sum of squares for each of these separately. So I made two empty models, one for wins and one for losses. So because I had two empty models, I divided the whole sample up into two groups. And each one had a different mean, because you already can see that the mean of wins is greater than the mean of losses. Um, as you can see from the bottom being further to the right than the top, bottom is wins. And I also calculate the sum of squares for each one. So take a look at those sum of squares. And the sum of squares is a lot larger on the bottom, right? So if you look at sum of squares as a measure of variability, you can see that there's like three times as much variability on the bottom as on the top. So, gosh, what are we doing with this? 
So why? Why is it there's so much more variability in terms of sums of squares from the bottom to the top? Anybody have an idea? Yes. yes. Go ahead. There was more games where they won, so there was like more points in the wins. So the more points that you have, the bigger sum of squares that you would have, no matter what. Anybody else got another idea? Yeah? Just to kind of rephrase that, sum of squares can't account for variation in sample size. So that's just the same size. Right. So the more games you have in this case, the more residuals you have. And the more residuals you have, the more squared residuals you have. And as you start adding them all up, if you have different size samples, you're going to get very different estimates of variation. So this is a problem with sum of squares, because if we're using sum of squares to tell us how variable the distribution is, um, it's not a really good way, because clearly, the bottom distribution may be a little more variable, but it's also the case that it's um, not three times as variable. Remember we talked about shape, center, and spread? This is a question of spread. And the spread is not three times bigger with wins than losses. And this is the reason why we have variance in standard deviation. And if you look at these graphs, by the way, the other thing that's important to note is that you can see, I didn't tell you what the sample size is, but you can see that there's fewer uh, games on the top than on the bottom. And just make sure you can see that. How do you see there's fewer games on the top? Just because the scales What's the scale on the left? What is the y-axis here? What is it? Count of what? Count <coughs> games. It's how many games. So you can just see if you add up all those games, there's fewer games on the top than there are on the bottom. So variance is the first step of another way of quantifying the variation in the distribution, or the error. It's another way of quantifying the error that corrects for differences in sample size. And the way it corrects for it is it basically takes the average of the squared deviation from the mean. So if you look at the top of this variance equation, S squared equals Y sub I minus Y bar squared, that Y sub I minus Y bar squared, the sum of those is the sum of squares. So basically, this is a wrong equation, basically. That should be the sum. <laughs> Sorry. So the sum of all the y sub i minus y bar squares, the sum of squares divided by n minus 1, is like the average of the squared deviation. And for now, don't worry, if you don't want to, about why we're dividing by n minus 1 instead of n. We'll talk more about that. But roughly, especially as the samples get larger, it's the same difference. So you're dividing by n, which means you're getting the average squared deviation. And what are we getting with standard deviation? We're just getting the square root of the variance. So the interpretation of variance is really clear. It's the average of the squared deviations. But the squared deviation itself is a very hard score to interpret. Um, somebody asked that in one of the questions before class. So, um, in this case, the squared deviation from the mean would be a squared point. So what is a squared point in a basketball game? That doesn't really mean much. We know what a point is, but we don't really know what a squared point is. It's not like feet and square feet. With feet and square feet, we know a foot is linear and a square foot is going to be a box, one foot on each side. But a point, what does that even mean? And so standard deviation, we take the square root of the variance, and we take the square root of the variance. I can't believe those formulas are wrong. Who made this slide? Jeez. Me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the square root of the variance um, takes the unit of squared points and changes it back to points. But it's not exactly the average distance of points from the from the mean either. It's just the square root of the variance. And so we have three different measures that we can use for quantifying how much error there is in a distribution around a simple model. So sum of squares, which is, we're going to really use that a lot. Actually, we're going to use all these measures a lot, but for different purposes. Variance, 
and standard deviation. These will be used for different purposes. Yes? Which one's the best one to use? Very. The best one is going to depend on the purpose. So, and I'll tell you like a few sentences, which may not make sense to you at this point, but if what you're trying to do is partition variance, remember we spent a lot of time talking about total variance or total variation, and we want to explain it. So we want to partition it into two parts. Data equals model plus error. Model is the explained part. Error is the unexplained part. For partitioning variation up into parts, sum of squares is really the best because it all adds up. Uh, on the other hand, we're going to get to some other statistics a little later, like the F ratio is a ratio of variances. You may have heard of that before. And standard deviation is the most useful metric for thinking about the actual spread in your data, because it actually means something. And you're going to develop why is that. Yes? I think your which equation was really wrong. Actually, the top two are both wrong. Because it should be the sum of the square deviations, not just the square deviations. I left out the sigma. Yeah, on both of them. I did a copy paste. I'm embarrassed. Can we not talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I promise my four yeah, post Can you write on the on the board maybe how it's supposed to look? Yes. Can you write on the board? Who can write the correct uh, equation for variance on the board. Could you do that, please? Come on. I appreciate that. Yay. Yeah. This would be a terrible time to blow it, so <laughs> just pointing that out. That's okay. Now you don't have to look up there. Just go right from your heart. That's okay. So. Oh, All right, I agree with you. That's not, the point. <laughs> That's not the point. All right. Very good. So, everybody remember what the sigma means? That does really not work like a sigma. <laughs> I think it's more like, oh. <laughs> kind of like that. Um, I'm definitely going to fix it on the side. But I forgot to sum them up. <laughs> Please, we won't even talk about it. OK, so for the Miami Heat, um, and by the way, you can use our code. We're not going to do it today because we just don't have the time. But you can calculate the variance of any distribution just by saying, uh, ver, um, and if you say points tilde when, it'll give you the variance for points in different levels of, of when, whether it's win or loss. And you can see the scores below there, 75.99 for losses, 99.80 for wins. That's the variance. And then if you take the standard deviation, SD, it's another really easy R function, um, you can see that the uh, difference in, uh, in the indicated total error gets lower and lower. So by the time you get down to standard deviation, the difference in standard deviation between wins and losses is about 1.2 points or something like that. So you can see it's not a huge difference in variation. But, but it's a little bit more aligned with what you see when you look at the actual graphs. So if you look at these graphs, this sort of lines it all up. Sum of squares, huge difference. Um, variance, 76 and 100, a little bit of a difference, like a 20% or a 30% increase in variance between losses and wins. But standard deviation, 8.7 to 10, about a 1.3 point difference. So that answers your question, Parsi, which is when do you use these? You use sum of squares, if I said, the beauty of sum of squares is if you said, oh, what if I just combine together wins and losses? What would the sum of squares be? I don't know if I'm correct on that. I wish G would pay attention. Um, but you can add sums of squares up. Whereas with variances, you can't just add them up. 
Okay, that's basically the point. All right, let's move on now and talk more about standard deviation. Um, because standard deviation as a unit of measurement is something that underlies the z-score, but it's also something we're going to be using as we're thinking about uh, distributions and sample distributions and statistical tests in the future. So first of all, I want you to get a sense of how to look at a distribution and see the standard deviation. So if you look at this distribution, I'm going to tell you the standard deviation is 2.9. I want you to sit and think and see if you can figure out a strategy for visually calculating or estimating that standard deviation. Go ahead and do that right now. And then I want you to tell me what your strategy is. So where do you look to see the 2.9? You can talk it over with the person next to you. Go ahead. And by the way, you can use anything you've learned from the reading as well as anything we talked about in class. All right, who's got a strategy where they can see it that they can tell us about? You do. <coughs> All right, our first strategy. Yes? Well, like from the readings, it talked about how if you were one standard deviation away on either side, on either about, side of? Of the uh, mean. Okay. That about 68% of your data is present. Okay. So if you want to visualize about 70% of your data on like in total on either side, like evenly, that would be one certification. And does that work out here? Do you see? I'd say so. It's a close to three, right? Okay, so you're saying you take the distribution and you try to look at the middle, roughly two-thirds of it in terms of the cases, and then you look at how far away you are in the middle. Who has another idea for how to do this? Or any idea? Or even the same idea, but you can describe it differently. I know you can't make a signal, but... Okay. Don't you just add it to the mean on either side? So one standard deviation away would be well, that's not my question. My question is, if I didn't tell you what the standard deviation is, could you estimate it yourself just by looking at the histogram? So you wouldn't have to know what to add to it, would you? But it would have to be, like, if it was normal enough, it would be the 68.95, 99.7. So then you'd have to kind of... Fudge it down? Okay, anybody else got an idea? Yeah. So you know that 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations. So if you look at the highest point, it's 16, and the mean's around 7, so that's a difference of 9. So then you divide that by 3, and you get around 2.9. Wow, that's cool. So you're using the same empirical <laughs> rule, but you're saying three plus or minus three standard deviations should be 99.7%, which is roughly 100%. And so you said from the mean, which is about 6 up to 16, or 7 up to 16 is approximately 9. You divide it by 3, and you get the standard deviation about 3. Um, how did you decide to use the upper part of the distribution and not the lower part? Because couldn't you use the lower part the same way? You know that, well, the lower part would be covered within like two standard deviations, because it's only around like 6 or 7. But you know that it has to cover 99.7, so that's like from 0 to 16. So you have to use the upper part, I think. Anybody else got an idea on this? Yeah, I think that because you knew it was 2.9, and you knew it was about 10 on the top, you knew you could divide that roughly into 3 and get 3. But if you didn't know it was 2.9, I'm not sure how you would know whether to use the upper part or the lower part. OK, whatever strategy you used, test your strategy and see if you can estimate the standard deviation of this distribution. And I think this is a, yeah, and I'm going to give you those choices. OK, so 
do your best. What is the standard deviation? This is assists, by the way. The number of assists in the game. Did you have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, no, you're just holding it. Okay. assists in game eight, or you can use standard deviation as the measure. Who can tell us how to use standard deviation? Yeah. Uh, I think it's um, positive two standard deviations from the mean. No, that sounds good. Positive two standard. How many people saw positive two standard deviations from the mean? Okay. Two standard deviations from the mean. And I just put it there in case you didn't see it. So what about game 20? How would you describe that in terms of standard deviations as a measure? I cannot remember. Yeah, it's positive 2. All right, who's got an answer for game 20? Yes. Okay, 0.5, or you could also say negative 0.5, because it's five below the minimum. Okay, and you can see I put the one standard deviation there, and you can see it's 0.5. All right, so this is what a z-score is. A z-score is simply translating any particular score in the distribution into a new unit of measurement, which is S, or standard deviation. So this formula is correct, by the way. Um, so where in the picture do you see Z?
Where is the Z? Who can point out what part of the picture would connect to Z? There's the formula for Z. We all went over that. Where's that in the picture? number of orange bars. Okay, everybody see that? It's the number of orange bars. So when we take the distance from the particular point we're talking about, gain 8 at 30, we subtract it from the mean, okay? So we're going to get 10, and then we're going to divide it by S to find out how many standard deviations fit into that distance, and it's exactly 2. So it's using standard deviation as a measuring unit for the distance of a score from the mean. All right, where is S in this picture? S is standard deviation. Where can you see it in the picture? Yeah. One of those bars is standard deviation, OK? So is S equal to 1? <laughs> it's, it's the, the <laughs> length of one of the bars. Yes. OK? And where is Y sub I minus Y bar represented here in the picture? Because that's the other part of this formula. Where do you see y sub i minus y bar in the picture? Yeah, show me it with your hands. Where is it? Where is y sub i minus y bar? It's not moving. It's one spot. Ah, right? If we're talking about variation, it's moving. But if we're talking about y sub i, it's right there. And y bar is right there. And that's where it is. And you can see it's from 20 to 30. So y sub i is 30 minus 20. So this is z-score, is taking the actual distance in terms of the units that we use to measure the outcome variable and transforming them into standard deviation units. So go ahead and plug in those numbers just to see what you get for a z-score. Just literally in your notebooks. Make sure you understand how to do this calculation. Plug those numbers in. Okay, did everybody get an answer? Yeah? Yeah, sure. Okay, two. And what is the difference between Z and y sub i minus y bar. What's really the difference between the Z and y sub i minus y bar? Uh, Z is the number of standard deviations, whereas y i minus y bar is the actual units between those two values. The actual distance. Or distance. And points. Yeah. Okay. So z is basically taking the distance between the two points in the distribution and transforming it into standard deviations, OK? So in the book, we talk a lot about why you would want to do this. We're not going to spend any more time on it today. But ultimately, um, there are a lot of reasons for expressing how you know, a point's spot in the distribution in standard deviation units. Let's say uh, you take my statistics class and you have a friend who takes somebody else's statistics class. And you both got a grade in points, like 80. And your final grade was 80 points. You can't really compare them because it's completely different measures and completely different test items and so on. So, but you could say, what's your z-score? Z-score would say, well, if the mean in my class is 80, you'd say, what's your Z-score if you got an 80? How much is the Z-score? 
the mean of the distribution is, is uh, 80 points, and you got 80. Your z score is zero. Your zero standard deviation is above or below the mean. But let's say your friend was in another class, and the mean was 70 points, but their z score was plus two. That means um, they were two standard deviations above the mean. So relative to their class, they did better. Z-score is a way for you to compare across different distributions, different measures, and get a sense of where a score is in relationship to the whole distribution. <coughs> so now we're going to move and talk past just quantifying error and talk a little bit about modeling error and what that actually means. And, and in particular, we want to talk about why we want to model error. So, We've talked about modeling the mean, and, and we've developed, spent a lot of time developing the idea that uh, if you want to model the, the distribution with one number, you would use the mean. And that becomes your model of the data generating process for the population. So if I asked you, and this is field goal, three pointers, okay, this is three point shots. If I asked you um, to predict uh, the next game, what do you think is going to be the number of field goals? Your best prediction is going to be the mean. That's your point estimate. Okay? And again, we talked about how it's not going to be right, but it's going to be better than nothing. If I did if you didn't know what the mean is, you could come up with any number of field goals. And, but the mean is going to be your best prediction. But if you want to make a prediction not about the mean, but about uh, some other probability in this distribution. You're going to need a model not just of the mean, but also of the shape of the error. Yes? So in this case, our mean is 6.7 field goals, which is not a plausible number of field goals that you could pick. So how would we know? Would we just round up? Is that, would that be default? Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you can be sure it's not going to be 6.7. So if it's only one game, you'd probably say, uh, probably seven, okay? But if I said, what do you think is gonna be the average field goal for the next two games, then you go right back to 6.7. And if I say, what do you think is gonna be the average field goal for the next 80 games, you go right to 6.7, and you'd be even more confident that that was gonna be the average for the next 80 games than you were that it's gonna be the number in the next game, right? So the, the more aggregate your prediction is, the more confidence you're gonna have. So, but, in, but what if I asked you, what is the likelihood that there's going to be more than 15 three-point shots, three-point field goals in the next game? To calculate that, you need to know more than just the mean. You need to know something about the probability that something's going to happen. And that involves modeling the distribution as a probability model. So, so what does this mean? First of all, let's keep track of where we are in our distribution triad. <coughs> if we take our distribution of data, the 82, that comes out of the sample distribution. But as soon as we start seeing that same distribution as a probability model, it's a model of the data generating process. And it could be the best model that we have. Just like the mean of the sample we choose is the best model, the best model we have of the mean, you know, of the next sample, or it's the best predictor we would have of a single next game. If we want to know what's the chances of the next game there being more than 15 field goals, three pointers, um, we would need to treat this as a probability distribution. So see if you can think about how you would do that. How can I use this as a probability distribution? to answer the question, what is the probability of a game with more than 15 three-pointers? See if you can figure out a way to answer that question based on <coughs> this distribution. Okay, and then see if you can look at these choices and figure out which of them might help you estimate that probability. 
So again, we want to take the distribution, we want to model the shape of the distribution, the error, we want to model the error, and we want to think about what's the probability that the next game there would be more than 15 pointers. somebody who said option D, which was half the class. 15 minus 6.7. Oh, that should be divided by 2.9. I don't know what I I assume that's what you thought. And you thought it was point 2.9. What did you think that meant? Who chose that? Divided by 82, which was the total number of games in this data set, 
and that's going to give you roughly uh, an estimate of the probability. So, um, but, uh, yes? By 82. Um, because if I say um, I have five dollars and I'm going to give you one, what percentage? Am I, how would you figure out the percentage of my dollars that I'm giving to you? I take my one dollar and divide it by five, right? And I'm giving you 20% of my dollars. This is the same thing. One game out of 82, I divide one by 82, and it's going to tell you the percentage of games that had more than 15 three-pointers. And that percentage is going to be my best probability, if I'm using this as my probability model, the data, that's going to be my prediction for the likelihood or probability that the next game is going to be, is going to score more than 15 three-point shots. Now, Parsi, your idea was also good. You could take this distribution and decide to model it as a normal distribution. And in fact, this is the most common thing we do, is we take the normal curve, which we've, we've studied in chapter six, and we know that normal curve is like a whole family of curves, but to specify which normal curve fits our data the best, all we have to do is say, what is our mean, what's our best estimate of the mean, and what is our best estimate of the standard deviation, which is gonna be the standard deviation, and we're gonna put those in, and that'll generate the normal curve that fits our data the best. And if you know that the area under the normal curve is equal to 100%, then we have ways of calculating the probability of, uh, of a particular point in that curve. So one thing that I remember thinking when I was first studying statistics is why do you think you can put that normal curve on top of the distribution because it doesn't really look exactly normal. So the question that I would ask you is, why is it that it would be better to use the normal curve to estimate probabilities than it would be to actually use the data that we got? Anybody got a thought on that? So there's using the data we got, and here is the idea of using the normal curve to calculate the probability. Why would it be better to use the normal curve than to use the actual data? Or maybe it wouldn't be. Yes? Um, using data that we got or like from the simulation could end up in different, end up with different probabilities, whereas a normal curve adds like consistency to your answer. So probably one probability you can draw from a normal curve rather than from your data. Yeah, any other ideas? And why it makes more sense maybe to use the normal curve than your actual data? I mean, I think that's a good answer. That's sort of my answer, which is you could have a fluke observation in your data. Like, in a way, this one out here really could just be a fluke. I mean, uh, one game where they have that many field goals could happen. It might only happen once in 100 years. Who knows? But the point is, you have a sample of 82 games. That's not a very big sample on which to take and create a probability for for that. By the way, what did you get when you divide 1 by 82? Anybody do that? 1.2%, okay? And so if this was a fluke in your data, you might say, you know, that 1.2% might be overestimating the probability of the next game having more than 15 points. And it might be overestimating because i got to remember my sample is only based on 82. The reason I made this is because what I did here is I just simulated samples of n equals 82 from a normal distribution with the exact same mean and standard deviation that we had here, a mean of 6.7, standard deviation of 2.9. And if you look at those distributions, each one of those is a distribution of 82 simulated games. And again, this is something you guys know how to do now. Um, you, you can see that they kind of vary all over the place, you know? In fact, none of them really looks exactly normal. The middle one on the top looks a little bit normal. But the one over there looks really skewed down to the right. This one looks kind of skewed to the left. 
and so on. And any of these, you can make the argument that we don't want to use the normal distribution. But what we know about all these is that the actual distribution of the population, because we simulate it, is normal. So <coughs> the reason I show you this is because it's not that outlandish to use the normal distribution as your model of error. So where do we see probability on this normal curve? Where is the probability? So where would we see the probability of a game with greater than 15 three-pointers? Okay? Where is it? Where can you see that probability? Who can tell me where that is? You don't have a lot. Where's the probability? Where would we look? Assuming this curve is a probability distribution, which means the area under it is going to add up to 1.0, where do you see the probability of the next game having greater than 15 three-pointers? 15 three it would be the space under the curve all the way to the right, like bar 15. Right. Everybody see that? It's assuming that it's coming out of this normal distribution, and we're estimating where the normal distribution is using our mean and standard deviation, and then we're going to look at that curve. We know that 100% of that curve is a probability of 1.0, and we say the next observation, the next game, is what is the likelihood it's going to be out there, and it's going to be the area in that tiny little tail. In R, we have this function xp norm, and somebody asked about it last time. So I actually went and did this xp norm, and it's pretty simple. You say 15. That's going to draw that boundary at 15, and you can see where it's drawn in the figure below, that's produced by xp norm, is way out in that tail. You see that tiny little green speck out there? That's the probability of the next game having 15 three-pointers, or greater than 15 three-pointers. And then xp norm will also calculate that probability, and the probability it calculates is 0 0.002. So, 1% would be 0 0.01. So this is significantly lower than 1%. And quite a bit different than the 1.2% that we got when we calculated it as 1 divided by 82. And we don't know which of those is actually accurate. Um, but, but honestly, in the scheme of things, they're close enough. You know, given that we're all talking about predictions and we know we're going to be wrong anyway. All right, I think we're going to end here. Wait a second. I didn't mean end here. I mean end here. Um, and talk just for a minute about the empirical rule. Because the empirical rule that we brought up earlier when we were estimating standard deviation, we talked about using standard deviation as a unit. This is something you can literally use all the time when you're looking at data. So. You're looking at data, if you can look at the distribution, if you can superimpose a normal on top of it in your head, and you can divide that up and think, where's one standard deviation below, one standard deviation above, you can actually find those probabilities yourself without even using XP norm, roughly, in your head. You would definitely want to calculate, but you can sort of look at it and roughly calculate it. So, take a look at that again. We'll probably have some questions on this and this on the quiz. But next year, next week, we're going to move into explanatory models with explanatory variables. Chapter 7 stuff. A lot of stuff in there to get started. Hey guys, before you leave, oh wait, quick word of advice from uh, someone who's gone through this more recently, maybe than Dr. Oh, <laughs> it's a great way to get a teacher to start asking questions right at the last day of class. Start filling all your stuff and distracting everyone before the teacher talks. It's really hard to hear when you're slamming your stuff down or something. That's how you get people in touch. So, thank you, Adam.
And did you figure out why the... Oh, yeah, if you take the derivative of this function, it simplifies to the, the formula for a mean. So that's why it's the 